The American Patriot by Stephen Kuntz What is patriotism? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Is patriotism alive and well? Or is it some fossil from the old days that we don't even have to think about anymore? What qualities do patriots have in common? And how would I know a patriot if I see one? America has had many patriots and we'll talk about some of them. And from them, try to define the term patriotism. The patriot I revere the most was our first president, George Washington. He grew up in the mid-1700s in colonial Virginia, one of the 13 colonies on the eastern seaboard ruled by Great Britain. He got a decent education, excellent by the standards of the times, and could read and write and do math well enough to be a surveyor. He surveyed huge tracts of land in what is now Virginia, West Virginia, and Maryland. Virginia's governor commissioned Washington a major in the militia and sent him into the wilderness to help a private enterprise, the Ohio Company, build new settlements and posts for trading with the Indians. They ran into the French, who were expanding into the Ohio Valley. Soon, the clash of European rivalries exploded in America as the French and Indian War, and in Europe as the Seven Years' War. Major Washington, leading a company of militia, that is, armed citizen volunteers, accompanied British General Braddock on his march to conquer Fort Duquesne at present-day Pittsburgh. Braddock's little army was ambushed. He was killed, and Washington helped save the command. He was young. He saw the blood and smelled the gunpowder and learned some valuable lessons in military leadership. In the ferment leading up to the Revolution, the area around Boston, Massachusetts was a hotbed of resistance to British colonial policies, which many saw as tyranny. You've heard of the Boston Tea Party, Samuel Adams, and Paul Revere. You've probably also heard of Revere's midnight ride to warn the militia of the outlying towns that the British were marching from Boston to seize their weapons and gunpowder. It was there, on the outskirts of Boston on the 19th of April, 1775, that American patriots first stood tall enough to be seen and heard around the world. The Minutemen. Farmers and tradesmen willing to fight with only one minute's notice grabbed their muskets and shotguns and assembled on the village greens in the path of the advancing British troops. At Lexington they refused to disperse. The British troops fired a volley, killing a few. At Concord the troops ran into more militia and after a sharp exchange of volleys began their retreat. The British columns, now 1,700 men counting reinforcements, were fired upon constantly all the way back to Boston by militia members coming on the run, and some of the encounters became full-fledged battles. Over 250 British soldiers were killed or wounded at Lexington and Concord and in the retreat to Boston. Think about it. By firing on the king's troops, these Americans were rebelling against the king's rule, committing treason. The penalty for treason was death. All the farmers who had aimed a musket or shotgun at the red-coated soldier risked the death penalty if British soldiers didn't kill them outright. Why did they do it? Because they believed in the justice of their cause, had the courage to fight for it, and if need be, die. The next day, militia, common citizens who had elected officers and agreed to obey orders began arriving from all over New England. They bottled up the British in Boston and dug in to keep them there. Two months later the British attacked a rebel formation on Bunker Hill finally forcing the militia to retreat, although not before the British took more heavy losses. The Continental Congress realized it had a war in its hands and appointed the tall red-headed soldier from Virginia George Washington as general-in-chief. He accepted the appointment well knowing he would be hung as a traitor if he were captured. Every signer of the Declaration of Independence knew the same thing. If the British captured him, he would be hung. In fact, every person in America knew that if the revolution failed, the British would hang every prominent rebel they could catch. Despite this reality, or perhaps an acknowledgement of it, the final sentence of the Declaration of Independence states, And for the support of this Declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, 
we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. John Hancock was the first man who signed the Declaration. He said, I will sign my name so large the king can read it without his glasses. And he did. As the other delegates signed, Benjamin Franklin gave a sober warning. Gentlemen, we must all hang together, or assuredly, we shall all hang separately. Would you sign a pledge to support your fellow citizens with your life and your honor? Then do it. Amazingly, every soldier, sailor, and airman who has enlisted in the armed forces of the United States in the past, right up to today, does just that. They put their life and their honor on the line for the benefit of you and me. Patriotism is faith and courage with a willingness to act, to stand up, and to be counted. You know the rest. George Washington forced the British Army to evacuate Boston and was himself forced to flee New York when the British used large formations of regular troops against his poorly trained volunteer militia. Yet in the bitter winter of 1777 he devised a counterstroke. He led his half-starved freezing troops in a dangerous Christmas Eve crossing of the Delaware River, attacked the British at Trenton, and in a brilliant lightning campaign ran the British out of New Jersey and saved the revolution. It was Washington's strategy that led to the capture of British armies at Saratoga in 1777 and Yorktown in 1781, effectively ending the revolution. With the war won, the colonies were flat broke. The national government was saddled with debts it had no way to bear, they said, and used the army to take over the government. This was precisely the course chosen by Napoleon a few years later when he crowned himself Emperor of France. For Washington refused. He was having none of it. He said that it was up to the people's representatives to solve the problems facing the new nation. He resigned his commission as a general and went home. Can you imagine it? Power, fame, the siren call to be the savior of your nation. And George Washington said, no, our elected representatives must work out the solutions that we can live with. This affirmation of faith and the ability of a free people to solve their own problem is, in my mind, one of the greatest acts of patriotism in American history. Think how different our history would have been if Washington had taken it upon himself to be the American Messiah. He could have done it, you know, he was hailed even then as the father of his country, the leader who had struck off British chains. The soldiers would have followed him. Yet he went home to Mount Vernon on the Potomac and once again became a farmer. Four years later, after dark dismal days and much political turmoil, the Virginia legislature selected Washington as one of its delegates to the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, where he was elected chairman. Listening carefully, saying little, he presided as the delegates debated on how a new government should be constructed and watched as they wrote the United States Constitution. After ratification, Washington was unanimously chosen by the electors of the 13 states to be our first president. Faith in the political process, faith in your fellow Americans, those qualities are the beating heart of patriotism. Every soldier who wears a uniform and risks his or her life for their country, every citizen who participates in the political process to make their country better, every person who considers it a duty to go to the polls on election day and vote his or her conscience, every person who writes a letter to the editor, every person who pays their taxes, every person who writes a letter to their congressman and demands action, Every person who honors soldiers and sailors who died to keep this nation free, they are the patriots. Like the Minutemen and George Washington and those brave souls who signed the Declaration of Independence, knowing it might be their death warrant, the American soldiers who fought at Gettysburg and Shiloh and the wilderness, 
and the Americans who waded ashore on the beaches of Normandy and Iwo Jima and fought in all the other grimy little places where men died hard. These patriots have in common a deep abiding faith in their fellow Americans. Some call patriotism love a country, yet it's not dirt patriots love, it's people. They thrill when the flag goes by and the national anthem is played. They participate in the political process because they know in the depth of their soul that their fellow Americans are trying to do the right thing, and eventually will, when they figure out what it is. Freeing the slaves, fighting poverty and racism, defending freedom here and around the world, leveling the playing field for everyone, giving people the freedom to be whatever their talents and ambitions will allow, the freedom to go wherever their dreams take them. Americans have been at it for many generations. Patriots, believe in America. This marvelous, wondrous place we call the United States is your heritage. It's a gift from all Americans who have gone before you. The flag, the history, the blood, tears, and dreams, all of it. This is your country. Stephen Coons was born and raised in West Virginia. After graduating Cross, after the war he became a flight instructor on A-6 aircraft, then did a ship's company tour aboard USS Nimitz. After nine years of active duty, Mr. Koontz returned to civilian life. He held several jobs, including a stint as a police officer in Longmont, Colorado, before attending the University of Colorado School of Law. After graduation, he was admitted to practice law in West Virginia and Colorado. He retired from the Naval Reserve after 21 years of service with the rank of commander. Mr. Koontz's first novel, Flight of the Intruder, was published in 1986 and spent over six months on the New York Times bestseller list. The stunning success of that Vietnam flying story allowed him to devote himself full-time to writing. He has published 32 books so far, 16 of which have become New York Times bestsellers. He and his wife, Deborah Jean, reside in Colorado, where he continues to happily scribble on.